my name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Now it's an inescapable fact that for whatever reason, there aren't that many ladies actually fishing on the UK scene. Even less so at the required level to form a pool from to select from for international duties. Just why that should be so is something the country's various governing bodies really ought to explore more fully, then make every attempt to rectify. So what better place to start then than when England's most cap lady fly fisher, ex-team captain and now Ladies International Fly Fishing Administrator Wendy Patchett, who I'm linking up with here. Even more impressive is the fact that that is only a snapshot of your angling CV, more of which later. First things first, why the numerical lack of interest from ladies throughout the whole range of practical angling disciplines? Well, I think there is an issue with family commitments. I think also the gender trends generally play really quite a big part because fly fishing, let's face it, is hugely male dominant in terms of numbers and it can be very daunting. You need something or, or someone to really get you started but then beyond that I think you've got to feel really comfortable with it and you've got to have the confidence to progress or to keep on going. I think you have to decide what it is also that you want out of it. Fishing for fun is absolutely great, but there is a whole new other side to it, and that's if you want to compete. And I think you need to decide what it is you want, what you're looking to achieve, what you're looking to get back. These days, once perceived no worries for the so-called gentle sex have now pretty much all been eroded away, and rightly so. So what can or is being done to ensure this message gets across? Are, or can women, be as competitive as men? Not as competitive. Of course they are. A woman is no different from a man in that respect, but as with all walks of life, not everybody has that competitive streak. It's always been the the mission of, of England ladies fly fishing, certainly, to promote fly fishing by, for and amongst ladies. That is its objective. And... I and others have campaigned for this really since 1989. I'd like to think we've achieved quite a bit, but there's still so much work to do. It would be fabulous to get some more publicity, to get some backing and support so that we could get a full structure in place to support it. Because at the moment, if anybody has an interest in it or wants to pursue it, then to a large extent, you've got to do it for yourself. Would I be right in thinking, and I'm not aiming this specifically at you, that once you get onto the competition scene properly, you also need to be a little bit ruthless in your objectives? Again, you've got to decide what you want back from it, and if you want to compete, and if you want to be at top level, yes you do, you've got to have, I suppose, an element of almost selfishness in a way to pursue that dream, and... I think from my point of view, although I achieved a lot, I have always tried to balance my life out as best I could. So in other words, I've still been able to have a family, I've always pinned down a full-time job, and not just a job, but a career. And so if you really wanted to hit the pinnacle of pinnacles with it, the same as anything else, I guess, then you know you aim for that and that alone and just concentrate all of your efforts into that. Would it be right to suggest that for women to achieve the same levels as a man, she has to be even better? Oh, that's a big question. There's maybe a big argument for that. I think you've got to be really good to get noticed. If you're talking about team selection and that kind of thing in a mixed team, I think you've got to have, yeah, sort of a a good streak about you and, and an edge. Without wanting to sound condescending, I can appreciate that handling lugworms and maggots is not going to appeal to the same numbers of women as perhaps men. But with fly fishing, there isn't any of that. Other than handling fish when caught, everything about fly fishing is quite literally clean. Yeah, there are a lot of lady course fishers, um, but fly fishing, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I'm not sure I could do the maggot lugworm type thing. I'm not sure I could do that at all. And initially, when I first started, I didn't even like to touch the fish, but I soon got over that and 
it sometimes can get a little bit messy. I mean, one of the things you do if you're fishing competitively um, to try and understand, for example, what the fish has been eating is to, when you, you catch one, to spoon it. And that's not the most pleasantest of things in the world to do, but if you really want to understand what diet the fish is on at that precise moment, then that is what you do. If I'm honest, looking at some of the jobs that women have to do when looking after babies, which often men are not too keen on helping with, I would have thought that spooning a fish would be the least of their concerns. <laughs> True, there's far worse things in life, yeah. And dare I say, there could even be advantages to being a lady fly fisher. Patience supports better multitasking skills, and a softer approach to playing a fish could at times potentially offer a very real advantage. Yeah, I mean, there are times when um, bullying in stockfish can be the way to go, but if you're catching the more, or you're going after the more mature fish, they're streetwise, and those kind of tactics aren't going to work best. Yeah, you need to have a lot of patience, and, and I do think, generally speaking, broad brush, then arguably we are a bit better at that. And be prepared to give it time, you know. For example, if you're in a certain position in your boat, it just doesn't seem to be working, You've got to give it enough time to prove that it's not working, just not just have one drift and think, oh, that's no good, and move on. You, you, you've got to have the patience with it. If your gut instinct tells you, well, it really ought to be, and I just maybe need to try something a little different or a slight variation on what you're doing, and be prepared to stick with it. And is that something women do better than men? I think they do, yes. Explain. Um, it does come down to patience, I think. We would be more prepared to sit something out and give it an opportunity to work rather than making a quick decision, no it isn't, and then charge off somewhere else. Um, I've seen guys in matches, particularly boat fishing, not able to settle at all and they spend most of the match time then just motoring around. Well, you're losing competition time if you're doing that. You can't catch fish if you haven't got your flies in the water. Old adage, but hugely true and you really need to be prepared to work methodically through your game plan, match plan, give everything the opportunity to work, and only when you're satisfied that it doesn't, then you move on. Can we now jump back to that impressive CV I hinted at earlier? Talk us through, if you will, what you've achieved. I've got 18 England caps at Home International, which are lock style events and 11 of those are gold medals. I've got four England caps at European, so that makes 22 England caps in total. I've also got one international honour at the Commonwealth Championships. It's not recognised as a full England cap, reason being it's an invitation match both for the teams to compete and also for membership of that team. So that's what makes it very different, but none the more for that. It was very lovely and memorable to be able to take part in one. I managed to top rod for England in home internationals on three occasions. The first one was very special to me actually. Um, I qualified first of all in the first ever English ladies national there was in 1989. I was encouraged to enter it and take part in it. I'd never done a competition before up until that point. It was on Grafton Water, or scheduled to be on Grafton Water, and it's the water I know locally to me, so I thought I'd go and compete, because at least it was a way for me at that point in time to be able to go and meet other women, because I didn't know any other women that fished. So I decided, okay, I'll go and enter. So I entered the competition, but about three weeks before it was due to take place, there was an issue with blue-green algae and the match was decided to be moved. Buell Bridge stood in at the last moment and said that they would very kindly host the event and so along I went. I, well, I'd, I'd never seen Buell water before, let alone fished it, but there again, the objective for me was to go along and compete and, and meet other ladies and that's what I did. So I had a taste of competition on that day and I had a lovely day. It, it rained but it was fine and I was catching fish and at the end of the session when we came in after the eight hour match, we weighed in and I was astounded because I'd come fifth. Wow. 
looking back, that was just something a bit special, really. But there again, I hadn't, I hadn't particularly been nervous because it wasn't my objective in a way. But having achieved that fifth place, that qualified me for my first international. So going along then to that first international event in uh, 1990 that was hosted by Lynn Brennig. It was the Welsh team's turn to host the event. Oh, it's a fabulous, beautiful water there. Love it. It's still one of my favourites to this day. And I did my best on the competition day there and I was top rod for England. And in your first sort of competition season and first international to be able to do that, that was really very special. But that got me really proverbially hooked on the competition scene because once you've had that fantastic taste of success, you, you just want to do it all over again and then again and then again. So being top rod there was absolutely fabulous. It took me a little while before I was able to achieve that again. But it did come again in 1999, and this time it came with top individual overall. I was able to um, compete, it was England's turn that year to host, we were on Rutland, and I had a nine fish haul, and it was absolutely fabulous, and uh, as I say, not only top rod for England, but top individual and international champion overall. And again, whilst that was absolutely magic, that one was on a home water on Rutland and I really wanted to be international champion on one of the other international waters and that eventually came to me in 2008 when I fished at Lake Menteith in Scotland and again with a nine fish haul and I was really thrilled to bits, over the moon, fabulous. One of the very special things though on my CV um, that means a tremendous amount to me is the Benson and Hedges gold medal that I have because I'm the only lady to possess one of those. For people that don't know, I don't understand, the Benson Hedges competitions, they no longer take place due to restrictions on tobacco sponsorship, but in its day it was the match for club teams to enter and compete in and to win it was the pinnacle of achievement. They were six man teams and whilst I say man, it's kind of loosely and as much as it was an open competition but there were no or very few ladies that competed and I'm, I'm not aware of any full ladies teams or although I think in its latter years there were some that entered and had a go but women competitors overall in, in the tournament were really quite rare. I had fished it previous to 1997 for another team and, and the, the heats and the, the eliminators but I'd never actually fished before in a final. The year I got my gold medal in 1997 the winning team was Winchwood Otters and I hadn't been involved in the heats. There was a six man team that was good and it was fishing well but one of the guys got poorly and was taken very ill a couple of days before the national final so the team had qualified all the way through to the final and they were thrilled to bits to be in it but were suddenly a man short and I had been on their reserve list but they invited me to fish which was fabulous in itself and I was hugely honoured to go and take part. I wasn't able to do all the practising that the other guys had done but when I got there I had a full brief of all the information they'd discovered what, where I was fishing, what areas were fishing well, what flies they'd found to be working. They had some ideas that they wanted me to try out as well to see if I could make certain patterns work. They were well aware of what my skills were, my expertise, and basically then sort of left me to it. It was an open draw and the final was fished over two days. That particular year the final was on Rutland, so it was also a water that I knew really quite well. On the first day, it was a big, big wind, and whilst I'm not frightened of big winds in any way, shape or form, they were, really were big rollers, the waves on that day, and the rain was lashing down too. The guy that I'd drawn with, bless him, he was really quite inexperienced. He too had been brought in as a reserve for his team, and he wasn't really boat-wise at all. We got into some difficulty on one of the drifts. I was keen to fish as close to the bank as I could, 
and I left it to the last minute to start the motor and the motor wouldn't start and despite frantic pulling of the pull cord I could not get the motor going and our boat partner wasn't of any help because he wasn't used to driving the boat or used to the boat motor in any way shape or form. Unfortunately we ran aground. On the same drift was another one of my team members and he had drawn with a member of the RAF team. He called out to me and said can you not get it going? I said no. He said well do you do your best because of the big rocks to hold the boat off the rocks with the oar which I did. He then jumped out of the boat he was in, uh, paddled through the water, I said paddled, he was up to his chest, came across to the boat where I was, got the pull cord going and got the engine started and we managed to get the boat off the rocks. He then managed to make his way back to his boat, clamber back in and then carry on fishing. Throughout all of this melee though, I had slipped over in the boat and fell on my rod and broke it in three pieces. I was heartbroken that my rod, which is an extension of my arm, you know, was broken and I was really distraught. I had got a spare with me but it wasn't the same brand and it wasn't the one that I was normally used to fishing with. Prior to that point I'd managed to catch two fish. I did fish out the rest of the day but I didn't manage to take any more so I came in at the end of that day with just two fish. The rest of the team had scored fairly well and we were lying in fourth place overall but it was a question really of trying to get my head together and get right and get set for the second day because I didn't want to let the team down. Somebody lent me a rod so that I could fish the second day with something similar to what I was used to using and it was virtually an identical rod to my own so um, and we went out on the second day, different boat draw, different partners and it was just a fabulous day. Everything about the day went so really well for me. Again, we had a match plan because we got together after the end of the first day and went off and fished then the second and it was just wonderful. You know, you kind of have these purple ribbon days. Well, that was one of them. I took eight fish on that second day. There were very few people that got their limits of eight fish on that second day. The, the team captain of Winchwood Otters, he also had his eight fish limit. So I was absolutely over the moon. The other guys had caught pretty well too and it was enough as I say to put the whole team into gold medal position so at the end of the day that was what we achieved and it was fabulous because no woman has ever done that or will indeed now be able to again although other team competitions may come with different sponsors. It's just wonderful. Wonderful. I've done all kinds of other competitions and things in my time. I've had a go at distance casting. It's not always easiest for me because something I should tell you that I haven't mentioned until this point, I'm a lefty. And casting platforms for competitive casting are often set up for right-handers. There's something you don't tend to think about unless you are a lefty and of course then your world is completely the other way around to everybody else's or almost everybody else's. But I did have a go at it. There was a platform that I thought would suit a left-hander as well as a right in 1999 so I had a go at that and I was runner-up in the UK Distance Casting Championships which I held at the CLA Game Fair every year. So that was quite an interesting thing to do. Other things that I've done... Uh, I suppose somebody will always say to you, what's the biggest fish you've ever caught? And most of my fishing has not been about big fish, it's been coming in with the biggest basket. But when we're talking about big fish, I've had the biggest fish ever was an 18 pound rainbow that I caught a Lecklade. That was back in 2001 and that was just fishing for fun. But of course at Lecklade they do put some larger fish in there, although I have to say this one had a tail like a spade, but it was phenomenal oh, and, and to play that in on five pound breaking strain line was just something else. It took me a very long time and I had a very dead arm at the end of it but it was a super fish and uh, lock style well the biggest one I've ever had is, was uh, again a rainbow and that was eight pound twelve which I took Ibrook. It was a practice day for a ladies national championship and I was fishing with my regular Dave boat partner Dave Newing he, he always used to come and practice with me for big competitions bless him 
and we were out on iBook and yeah, £8.12, that was something else, that was. We brought him home for the table and yeah, he fed us on quite a few occasions, that fish. <laughs> From what you're saying, the bulk of what you do is boat fishing, but presumably it doesn't necessarily always have to be that way. So for those ladies who perhaps don't fancy going afloat, explain to us the full structure of ladies' competitive fly fishing. Well, definitely, it's, it's not all about boat fishing. That's just where my expertise lies. That's what I'm best at, um, and that's what I've always specialised in. But there are other types of fishing. There's the bank fishing from the small still waters, bank fishing from the large waters, it's river fishing. I have done an element of all of it with varying degrees of success. But for me, my passion and my love would always be lock style from a boat. I have competed though in the other disciplines, the uh, European events that I've taken part in, I fished in uh, Belgium in 2002 and that was all small water bank fishing. The other competitions that I've done and also an element of the Commonwealth event have been for river fishing. Majority of the European events are river fishing and again I've been to some fabulous venues fabulous venues there. Been very, very lucky, very fortunate. River fishing is a completely different discipline altogether and something you don't tend to think about maybe until you try and do it and then you'll very quickly understand is that to be successful you've got to be a very sure-footed, strong, sound wader. You've got to be able to negotiate the riverbed, to be quite nimble, sure-footed, and that's all before you cast a line. But you've got to have a very firm footing to be able to manoeuvre, to be able to cast the line, to be able to play the fish in and then successfully net it. And then you've got to get it back to your controller so that fish can be measured, adjudicated upon and then safely and successfully returned to the water because all of those events are catch and release. For any up and coming competitive lady fly fishers, what must they do to get themselves noticed from a potential international perspective? And as importantly, how do they maintain that position once it's been achieved? Really, you need to be able to practice. You've got to build up your experiences, gain in confidence, and take part in all kinds of competition. The national competition structure for women is one just of a national final. We're not numerous enough or plentiful enough to have regional and geographic heats and eliminators. That was always the intention or the goal to be able to get that off the ground in that way. But the numbers have, have never increased to warrant or enable that to happen. So really what I would recommend that is if you think you've got what it takes, then enter the national championships. In my day, what that meant was that the top 10 places in that national championship would qualify for ratification into the England team. That 10 together with the top four from the previous international, therefore making a team of 14, would be the full England team. Nowadays there is no carryover and the team is just 12 strong and in fact think maybe since my retirement it may have even have dropped to 10. There is but one home international each year and that's usually in June and each of the home nations takes in turn to host. The national event itself is normally scheduled for August and as I say to finish in the top echelons in that competition in August would qualify you for the international in the following year. Now obviously, none of this came about by chance. A CV like that takes time to build and has to be consistently worked for. So let's go back to your earliest recollections of starting to fish, progressing through to the time when you finally decided to hang up your international rods, which in your words was a particularly hard decision to reach. Okay, how did I start? Well, that's um, maybe a little bit of an unusual story. I mean, I, I didn't have a father that fished or a brother that fished or anything of that ilk and it was after I was first married. My first husband had, had always been a fisherman ever since he was a little boy, but it was coarse fishing, river fishing, where we live here in East Anglia, there's no fast flowing rivers. 
so he was a coarse fisherman. But a little while after we were first married, um, he decided he'd like to have a go at fly fishing because he'd never done that. So he learned how to cast the line and he'd go off um, at weekends with his friends and after a while it clicked with him and once it did I, I very rarely saw him, he was just gone weekend after weekend and he absolutely loved it, there was no question about that and so I used to grumble at him and, and moan, as you would I guess and one day he said to me, well why don't you come too? and I came very close to telling him where to put it but I thought no, no, I, I want to try and understand, I want to learn I'm intrigued, so I thought alright then I will so astounded as he was that I'd said yes, he thought, oh, right, OK, we'll go then to Rutland. So that was where I went for my first ever fishing trip. Now, I didn't appreciate that Rutland is the Wembley of fly fishing here in England because that is what it is for large still waters. And the first time I ever went, we went in a boat. I couldn't cast a line. I didn't really understand very much about it. I'd never done any kind of fishing at all. So he set me up a rod and just dangled it out of the back of the boat for me as the boat was free drifting across the water. And he was like, there you go, hang on to that as it were. Well, just by doing that over the course of a few hours, I actually managed to catch two fish and that straight away on this first fishing trip taught me two things. Firstly, how great it was and how challenging it was and really quite exhilarating to have something take the fly on the other end and then you try and, and play that in. That in itself was a challenge and then having got the fish in and dispatched it, you can take it home for tea. I mean, how cool is that? And the second thing it taught me was competition because on that day, my husband didn't catch anything. And he was doing it properly. And I was just dangling the line out the back of the boat and I had two. So it was like two nil. And oh, what a good feeling that was too. So anyway, that was my first ever fishing trip and, and I thought, yeah, I think I might like this. So I wanted to learn to do it properly. My husband had a friend that was left-handed, so he said, I'll have a word with him and see if he can teach you how to cast. Well, David agreed, and he taught me how to cast. Then once I could present a fly to the water, then I could begin to fish on my own. So I used to go along with the boys at the weekends, and I would fish. Locally, whether it was Rutland, Grafham, Ibrook, you know, wherever they went, I would go. And that really gave me my grounding and my bases for my fishing. And I learned to fish like they did. So in later times, when I met other women that fished, I realised then just how unusual I was because they all used to fish with an 11 foot rod. So, so did I but it's very unusual to find another lady that fishes block style with a rod of that length. Even to this day, that followed me through. I mean, in those days I used to fish with an 11 foot six. I then moved on to 11 foot three, but that's, that, that's as short as it ever got for me. As you say, quite an unusual introduction. But later, when selected for team duties, what's expected of each team member in terms of commitment and team spirit from the moment of selection until after the event? Yes, there is a level of commitment um, once you qualify and you are formally invited to take up a place in an England international team. The team has a manager and the manager will coordinate the practices he feels that team needs for the international for the following season. So you will have a series of practice sessions that the team manager would want you to attend. That practice session may be fishing a similar water that's central for the team here in England to where he thinks that that will replicate fishing conditions for the international that you're going to be fishing the following year and or it could be he wants you for a classroom session could be he will get in a speaker to talk about a specific technique or tactic for example if an international is going to be in Ireland in Ireland, you're fishing for wild brownies. Well, that's very different for fishing to, for a stocked rainbow water here in England. So there are different skill sets that you're going to need to go and fish over there. 
It could be that there's an element of your armoury that's perhaps a little weak. So he would recommend that you have a session and he might organise sort of half a day with an expert in that particular field. Say, for example, if you're not so hot on dry fly, well, he'd arrange for you to spend some time with a dry fly specialist so you can try and perfect those particular techniques. So that there's all manner of ranges of things and commitment that you need to be able to to attend to. I would say there were probably something in the region of between four and six practice sessions such as these. In addition to which, you need to keep up your own fitness and something over and above that, which I feel always gives you an edge. And I always define this as being match fit. And you're probably thinking, but it's fishing, what on earth are you talking about, woman? Well, that for me is just having that mental sharpness and awareness whilst you're actually fishing. It's not about being physically fit, that for me is a different aspect, but it's just having that extra mental edge that keeps you switched on, keeps you alert, that gives you the ability and awareness of everything that's going on around you, because in a competition it's just not what you're doing, but you need to be aware of what everybody else is doing too. Because, I mean, you could be having what you think is quite a good day, and, and maybe in the first two hours you've managed to get four fish in the boat well that might sound quite good but if somebody else has got eight you're lagging behind so you've always got to be prepared to try and find that extra gear and try and suss out what they're doing that's different and sometimes you might be able to visibly see what they're doing and so then you've got to be prepared to change and change quickly as i mentioned earlier you've had a number of roles within the england setup one of which has been team captain. So what exactly does a team captain do that is so very different from the rest of the team? Taking on the mantle of, of captaincy is definitely something very different. Equally, it's something that's also very, very special. To represent your country is fantastic and absolutely wonderful in your chosen sport, but to captain the England team Oh God, it's mega, it's huge, an amazing honour. It's something that's really cherished. And the way we cope with it in the world of fly fishing is that it's something that's passed on to the next eligible team member every year. So it's not something you have and you hold and you keep it for a long time. It's our belief, you see, that it's too precious to retain, but the honour should be shared. My time for captaincy, and I've had two opportunities of this, again, which is not that common. My first one came at a European event where I led England out in the European Championships in 1995. And that was something really very special. It was England ladies team in an event where it was predominantly men. All of the other teams, bar two, were male, and of the remaining two, one was mixed and the other one was women. But to lead England ladies out, and we came seventh, and that's the highest that England ladies have ever finished in a European Championships Open event. So that was a huge honour. The second time that captaincy came my way was to lead out the home international team. And again, it was to return to my beloved Lynn Brennig, and I know I've mentioned it before, but I've got such fond memories of this water and it's always served me very well. So I was really, really honoured not only to lead out England, but to do so at Brenning. It was fabulous and we won gold and it was just so very special for me. It's absolutely wonderful and, it, and it's so difficult to put into words as just what a huge honour it is. But it carries very different responsibilities and pressures because although as a captain you are also competing in the team but whilst you are competing you're worrying about everybody else in the team and are they okay I wonder if they're all right is there anything they need is there anybody in difficulty and you just seem to have an extra burden on your shoulders as well as trying to do well for yourself and also getting that to count towards the team's score it's just worrying about how everybody else is doing at the same time not a complete break from fly fishing, or for that matter the international scene, where you've served and still do serve both team and country in a variety of administrative posts. Yeah, I've always been for many, many years behind the scenes too, trying to make everything 
work from an administrative point of view and I've held varying positions for England ladies throughout the years. I've held the post of Treasurer, of Secretary, of Chairman. At one point was Secretary and Treasurer at the same time. I've also been Unity Officer in latter years. I've been the Accountant to the Confederation of English Fly Fishers. I did that for a three-year stint. But my affinity, I think, has always been with um, England Ladies Fly Fishing and I've served there well, really all the way through from 1991 right the way up to 2013, so I have many years service there. In the early days there weren't many of us to make everything work and in latter years what became separate roles, um, I used to do all of it, so for example membership secretary, news editor and press officer, sponsorship secretary, Later on, as more volunteers came forward, we were able to put individual people in, into those roles, but I used to write all the newsletters, send out the membership cards, and send press releases off to the papers, and yes, yeah, so at one time I was hugely, hugely involved. Given the choice, would you prefer to be supporting the team with the pen or with the rod? With the rod. And then you retired from both. Was it lack of time or waning enthusiasm? No, never a loss of enthusiasm. It was time that I became pressured over and also I think as you get older I was very fortunate to become international champion at the age of 50. I had a phenomenal year that year and that was fantastic but the body does take longer to recover and I was finding it more and more difficult to put myself through the regime of what it takes. To fish a competition is an eight hour stint and you need to control your body through all of that time and that gets more difficult as you get older. In a big wind as well, you've got the waves and all the muscles, you use muscles where you don't think you've got muscles and my body was taking so much longer to recover after that than it did when I was a much younger woman. The eyesight starts to go too, I guess in the last four years I've started to wear specs for the whole time and they're very focals and that's, I guess it's possible but it's so much more of a palaver in your boat and you are bobbing up and down and you've got to see to tie the flies on, you need to be quick, not be faffing about because you can't see to get you know the nylon through the eye and, and I did begin to find that really frustrating because if your flies aren't in the water you're not going to catch a fish. So I felt it was wasting time, I wasn't as sharp and as crisp as I once was and that was beginning to niggle me really. Other things were I needed to spend more time with family my mum was getting in poor health and as you now know I have lost mum and that was now a year ago but I'm an only child, I'd already lost my dad and I needed to spend more time with mum and do things for her and something I'd got to give. I've also got a daughter, she lives down in London, I'd like to see more of her. I've got a, a brand new man in my life and I met him in, in later years and uh, we married in 2008 and it's just so lovely now to have him with me and I also want to spend more time with him. I work full time, I still work full time, I'm still pursuing my career. I'm an accountant. I have a very pressurised and involved role at work full time and there's only so many hours in a day so it was a combination of things and it was a very hard decision for me to take to stop. But I felt it was right, the time was right for me to stand back. And it's about time some younger people came through anyway and took up the reins. Playing devil's advocate here, all things considered, are any of the England ladies as good as or even better than any of the men? Oh yes, definitely. And there have been some really good ladies over the years. They're not so numerous, but they are there and they do exist. I think maybe they would be more plentiful 
if there was a better structure for fishing generally and that would be true for both genders and even the youth. If we had a better structure that maybe Sport England could support, but alas, that's not the case. So it does come down to many things, one of which is having the wherewithal to be able to afford to go. And that's not just about money, but it is about time as well. Will the time ever come when men and ladies don't automatically separate off into the respective teams? A long overdue time when teams are selected on merit rather than gender. Yes, and I mean it, it has happened um, to a certain extent at the moment, but it would be really good if it went even further. I think it should be according to your skill and how good you are. And if there are ladies that are good enough, then why shouldn't they compete alongside? And as I say, in some instances, that does and can happen. And I've been very fortunate to be able to compete alongside guys. At the outset, you know, many years ago, I was quite a rarity, I suppose. And um, the guys were, oh, a woman. Without saying that, you knew that's exactly what they were thinking. But the best way to cope with that and to deal with it is just go out there and do your stuff. I've been in open competitions and I've drawn someone that doesn't know me from Adam and his mates have been teasing him, there ah, you've drawn with a woman, ha <laughs> ha, and all this and he's, oh dear, I'm going to have a dreadful day. Well, you know, at the end of the day when we've come in, I've had guys that have shook me by the hand and said, well done, thank you for a lovely day and I'll never be frightened or concerned about fishing with a woman again. And I think that's just fabulous. Do you think that your achievements will ever be surpassed by another English lady? Don't see why not. I think my time has been special, but it's not entirely unique, and I think there are others that would be very capable of taking that on. As I've said, I've always tried to balance my life, and there have always been other things going on within it. But if somebody was single-minded enough to just go out there and go for the sport alone without having any of the concerns or worries, then why shouldn't they surpass what I've achieved? An element of it is, yes, there has to be natural ability, there has to be inborn passion, and there has to be a will. But beyond that, it's then whatever else you can throw at it. Who for you, then, have been the best fly fishers on the international ladies' team over the years? For me, there were two women in particular when I was first starting out that I got to know and they were phenomenal and to be able to aspire to what um, they achieved and the way they fished was phenomenal. Firstly, Jeanette Taylor and the other one was Jeanette Ford. Jeanette Ford from Chew was terrific and absolutely red hot on dry fly. She was absolutely wonderful. Poetry in motion, when the fish were feeding on the service, to watch her in action, she was just absolutely amazing. She was well known and well respected down on Chew and she was just awesome. Jeanette Taylor, in a similar way, but her expertise was fishing below surface. She's the best ever fisher of the high D line that I've ever known and she was able to exploit it in a particular way and she was so successful at it. She'd had many successes against guys and again she was just absolutely incredible. So these were the two ladies that I aspired to when I first started out and it seemed to me if I could perfect both techniques how cool would that be and how awesome would that be? So that's really what I always aspired to do. I must say I was always better and more confident fishing below the surface but I did do my best to master and become a dry fly fisher too. With your knowledge of the past, the present and the future, does England have a good enough pool of up and coming talent to one day take over your mantle? Alas not. Of the youth coming through and there are some very good youngsters in the youth pool at the moment, very few are girls. They're really quite rare and it's very sad. I would love for there to be more and whilst I said it's time for me to stand down the younger ones to take it on, there aren't that many younger ones about. So yeah, it, it is very sad because it is such a fabulous thing to do. It really is. Fly fishing is just 
wonderful. I wonder, please, would you mind, I just had written a little summary to finish off with. I've had some wonderful success at a sport that I have loved. I've worked hard, been prepared to learn, make personal sacrifice and put myself through pain and discomfort in the pursuit of success. I've been to some wonderful locations and places that I would never have gone if it were not for my fly fishing. I've had many people to thank who have helped me and supported me along the way, but probably top of that long list is my daughter.